Welcome to Attack of Opportunity. Hello and welcome to Attack of Opportunity. Today, it is, I'd like to say distinct pleasure, but technically, Corey Thomas, who I have in the virtual house today, from the Dark Galaxies Network, is also, beside ourselves, running Star Wars Saga Edition, Dawn of Defiance campaign, and could technically be called competition, so I'm not completely sure how I feel about this man, but he has been kind enough to give us the time, and here he is interviewing himself. So, Corey, thank you so much for being on the show today. Hey, it's a pleasure. Glad to be here. So... As I've warned everyone, and as people have come to know, the very first question that we like to ask all of our victims is, how did you first know back in the day that you were possibly a geek, a gamer, a nerd, one of us, one of us? Man, that's a, that's a big question. I, I kind of always have been. I mean, as far as back as I can remember, um, you know, played video games, obviously, Super Nintendo, Genesis, Game Boy, Game Gear, all of that stuff. Uh, was a really big Star Wars fan, always into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, loved X-Men, uh, comic books. I liked to read. I was, I was really big into uh, Goosebumps and the Choose Your Own Adventure books. I don't know if you ever saw those when you were a kid, but it was basically oh, yeah. like, uh, kind of like beginner's D&D, really. You know, you, you open the book, it gives you some choices, and you switch, go to the page or whatever, and who knows what your fate will be, but... So I was always really kind of into that stuff. And I, I probably didn't really understand that there was a social stigma to that maybe till like middle school. Cause that's when I started getting treated a little differently for it. But uh, yeah, as far as I can remember, I've always been into kind of the nerdy or geekier side of things. Yeah. A lot of, um, a lot of people, the, um, I guess the geek genre goes back into like late seventies, eighties, and there's each generation that has a different experience. Uh, our generation have the you know you were you were sort of Stranger Things television show a bunch of people and they just kind of ignored you. You had your own little gang of people and you know meh. And then you get into the '90s and it gets to be a little bit more or, or '80s and great artists like I'm always mentioning uh, Larry Elmore and the Dragonlance Saga and Jeff Easley on the covers of Second Edition. And then you get into the '90s where Harry Potter suddenly makes D and D and everything cool. And now by <laughs> 2000 and more, everyone's just kind of like, it's just, oh yeah, that's that, that's that thing. I've heard of that. Yeah, it's fine. You know, and now I watched a video recently where they had Matt Mercer doing um, Stephen Colbert from The Tonight Show and he hadn't played since yeah. college and he did this solo one and I watched it um, for a charity and it was great. And you just see Colbert's face like just, I remember this. This is so cool, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and he was really into that. Yeah, yeah. And we're like yelling at television going, I've been doing this for over 30 years. It's our poker night. You know, yes, finally. Or, you know, validation <laughs> through famous people. No, you either do it, you love it, or you don't, you know. But it's nice there's less, you know, less um, tire slashing and stone throwing and, all the, and these days for, for our children's children's children. Um, you mentioned the Choose Your Own Adventure books. I actually remember one where you got to be Raceland doing the test of high sorcery itself that they mention in the Dragonlance novels. And you actually got to be Raceland at third level doing the test and going through everything. And, and I got, I got killed so many times, you know, <laughs> it's like, I don't think I ever finished. I just read it front to back to finish. Um, but was there a defining moment for you or um, like the gateway drug? Some people say, oh, it's the video games got me in. It's it, somebody put this, um, you know, book in my hand or, or dad was into sci-fi or, you know, was there, was there sort of that led you into it before you made the decision to be one of us? Uh, you know, I, I'd probably say the two, there was kind of like a certain period where like I got into activities where I really just felt like I was highly involved in the community. Uh, and first, obviously Star Wars. I feel like Star Wars was kind of the gateway to everything I did. Um, I was a huge Star Wars fan, had the toys, had the books and everything, but then uh, we found out there was a Star Wars role-playing game, and up to that point, I hadn't, I hadn't ventured into, like, the TTRPG realm of any, of any, of any kind. You're talking um, about the, the WEG D6 game, the old, old Star Wars game? Is that the one? A little bit, a little bit later than that. It was a revised second edition, so... Uh, I wasn't quite that far back, but it was about when Wizards of the Coast took over. Yeah, the D20 and the D20 revised. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Sorry, we, yep. we okay. started with those, and uh, it, it was my friends, and they were, well, I, first, really, they, they had a friend that was doing it, and he wanted to do it, but they didn't really, I guess, want, like, his story concept or whatever, and so then they were like, hey, maybe you could DM it. And I was like, okay. And then I got defaulted in the DM, and I've been a forever DM uh, ever, ever since then. But that was my first TTRPG. 
And with that same group of friends, I also really got into Magic Gathering at that point. And I think those two things are really what kind of cemented me. And I, you know, that was my, my gateway into the whole community. Cool, cool. Wow. Cool. I, like I was joking earlier about, um, well, I guess I should I should out this now is each interview now that we're getting off of our own cast and looking behind the scenes at us we're getting out into the community and, and content creators ones that have helped us and content that we use in our shows now I'm going after people that have original content uh, like Dr. Evil from the League of Villainy and yourself is the first person I found that's doing a network that also is carrying the Star Wars saga edition that a lot of people don't know was actually a prototype type by wizards of the coast for fourth edition which of course is you know it that is what it is but the saga edition um when they got to fourth edition dnd they changed a lot of stuff saga edition itself was really neat yes the jedi mm -hmm. are overpowered and stuff but running dawn of defiance i mean talk about getting to be in a movie that never made it to being a movie you're three months after order 66 you meet bail organa by the end of the first adventure and you're working for him pre-rebellion you are birthing the rebellion and i'm so surprised besides yourself and myself that there isn't still a ton of people revisiting this classic uh, i see websites and stuff about you know keep saga alive and everything everyone's run over to ffg where the force users have to like strain a hernia just to lift their keys it's what i hear i haven't <laughs> really looked at that one that's um, pretty much the gist i got and now you, you're actually not just going after this one, which I admire, or, or love to hate because you're my competition, but you're doing a network. Dark Galaxies is a network. And uh, before we get into discussing that, how long, because I kept throwing questions back to myself about my old old age, how long have you been a gamer? Been a gamer as a whole, like uh, for as long as I can remember. Um going back pretty young like I had a, I remember having a Game Gear and a Game Boy and Genesis and all that when I was younger um just always really been into like the video game aspect and then as soon as I was able to read uh, I really got into like lore and like universes and exploring the depth of that and again Star Wars is probably like my biggest gateway I had every single Star Wars book I read every single one the expanded universe was like my first real fandom um I was really sad that Disney kind of basically said none of that counts <laughs> yeah but uh uh yeah. yeah so yeah i was i was gaming and reading back then and then I, it's just grown you know every year since then as i've gotten into more different things you know outside of uh of just video games you know getting into card games uh, customizable mm -hmm. card games which actually my first one uh truthfully was star wars but i never really knew how to play it i just liked the pictures mm -hmm. um but uh and then you know magic and D, &D so yeah i've been a gamer for a while yeah, one kind of feeds the other. Uh, we have a recent old gaming buddy of mine has just rejoined the cast. He used to play um, revised D20 Star Wars with him, Joe Gibson, and he's doing a cameo as a sleeper that they found stowed away in a panel of the Gatrox 720. Um, and he's a cyborg, and he's a little bit, you know, he's like this space hippie that they've woken up. Um, and uh, he's having a lot of fun getting back into it. And... Um, we were playing d20 with him back in the day and now we brought him forward and my point is you never you never lose that itch like we're always saying oh i've played forever and i've put all you know i've been in and i've been in and I've been in. it's my poker night blah, blah 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 but even people that haven't played in a while it doesn't go away and it's exciting to come back and meet into something that's brand new um we're talking to nicole tuttle recently and she's a fifth edition gamer. And a lot of my guys were used to second edition, third edition Forgotten Realms. And they're all saying like, oh, you know, could you run us a one shot? Because, you know, they missed the Forgotten Realms. We love Pathfinder and Galorian, which is our mainstay right now. But it's like, wouldn't it be great to go back to the realms? Yeah, it's 100 years later. You never lose that, that itch. Um, now, I'm going to assume that you've been playing RPGs right after you said for a while you got into the D20 Star Wars. So that's mm, late 90s. Yep, that, that's about right. And ironically, the one RPG I never played was D and D. Um, all throughout high school, I played um, Star Wars. Obviously, I played Vampire: The Masquerade. I even played like an offshoot one called uh, Mech Warrior, which is insanely difficult, by the way. I, I, oh, remember, I remember that one. It. <laughs> it was so. It was so. I mean, I, okay, so as a player, when I yeah. want to play a character, I like to play quirky characters. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm kind of like a. Yeah, I did theater too. I always like playing the quirky like unusual goofy characters in the shows i'm kind of the same way in my rpgs 
And so in MechWarrior, I didn't want to play the MechWarrior pilot. I didn't want to play, you know, whatever. I wanted to play like basically this bureaucrat um, who was along with everybody, was good at influencing people, and um, but was kind of like along for the ride, but a wimp. Like he would he would do things like, oh, I don't care my own things. You can do that for me, you know, that sort of stuff. Let me tell you, that game's not designed for that. <laughs> uh, trying to play a character character in that game is insanely difficult. I couldn't shoot anything. I couldn't do anything. I was less than useless. I had a good time. I, you know, I did my best with it. It was Mech Warrior, one of the ones that were related to. I remember playing Robotech. I remember two friends sitting me down and we like binge the entire Robotech anime in one weekend. And I was about mm, like 15, 16, you know. And then I have my story on my own interview about Dragonlance and how I got into it. And then when I was late, uh, 18, 19, same friends, and we were playing a lot of Axis and Allies and stuff. They're pulling out these books, you know, Robotech. And I'm looking at the book and I'm like, I remember that. We watched this anime. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, look, check it out, man. It's a D20 game. You want to play? And we're like, okay. And we played a little bit of that. But I was so entrenched in fantasy at that time. I thought the, the sci-fi aspect was neat, but I kept going back to... The other one so mech warrior if i remember correctly was kind of a standalone was it tied to robotech i can't remember i don't think so i think mech warrior was its uh, own standalone ip yeah yeah okay sorry yeah there, uh, there was a it, it may have been I, i'm not i am not an expert on mech warrior at all no, i, I no, played no, this just, game because just... some other friends were playing it but as far as i know i know there was a game there was a book series uh like a video game uh kind of like a little tabletop type version of it uh, i think it was its own thing I had someone recently asked me about the title of the show, Attack of Opportunity. It's like, well, you're not mean to the guests. You're not, like, grilling them. And I'm like, no, but I constantly go on tangents about my own stories because they'll talk about something and it'll spark a memory. I couldn't sit down and go, this is the story of my life in DMing show. They, I couldn't think of everything. But whenever I'm interviewing somebody, they'll talk about what they did and it'll, it'll remind me and I'll take the opportunity to squeeze in the little anecdote, hence a tech of opportunity. And I thought it was obvious. And I have, I've, we've got a fandom going, uh, we don't get the title of your show. You're very nice to the guests. They're very nice to you. They don't seem to mind you interrupt them. I'm like, well, that's the point. I'm ta I'm taking, you know, it's their turn and I am taking my free attack of opportunity and you get extra stories. And is that okay? Is that cool? No, I'll stop. Hmm. <laughs> so what, uh, what made you decide to start making your own content to become the content creator? Cause that is a big step, loving it, getting obsessed in it, being the fandom, wanting more for you as opposed to sitting down going, I'm going to do something because I love this so much and hopefully they will like it. Uh, it was a pretty slow process, honestly. I, so Dark Galaxies Gaming, the original concept for it, um, for any of those who out there who are looking for a game table or whatnot, we, uh, we do professional dungeon mastering services. That was the idea. Uh, okay. So I started out on my own. I was uh, professionally DMing for you know several games a week. Uh, and I realized there was a really big need for that. And I was like, what if I had like a network of guys doing this and we can provide a service to people, you know, hey, you got a DM who's reliable, who's consistent, uh, who knows the game, and he will be there every week to run your thing. Um, and so we did that and it was really successful. And so I was trying to think of ways that I could bring more people to see it. And I was already a big fan of watching a lot of TTRPG shows, um, in particular, um, Regal Goblins, uh, Koibu. I watched a lot of his stuff. And I was like, you know, that'd be a lot of fun. I enjoy playing anyways. I'd like to stream. Uh, you know, I'm not shy about it. I've, you know, I've done theater and stuff, so I'm not afraid to be in front of people. I was like, and I, you know, I could let people see what we do, um, see, you know, how much fun we're having. And if they like what we're doing, they can also play with us in our company. So that was the original idea. Hmm. Um, and it ended up being a little bigger than I thought, though, because, you know, I, I, I was like, well, who should I reach out to? Should I, like, be interviewing people on Roll20, the players that we're already playing with? Or should I try to network with some streamers, you know, some influencers or whatever? And somehow I, uh, I guess I rolled good on my charisma check and I, I got a few uh, decent names on our shows. Um, and just kind of took off from there. So uh, Rise of the Dragon Queen was our first show. And uh, despite some early on audio issues uh, that we eventually ironed out, um, it's been good. You know, people are enjoying it. We've had a decent following on it. And uh, yeah, and it's spawned even more shows since. That's cool. That's like a completely different take than our current business model, <laughs> where we basically had one podcast that became several podcasts. And every time we uh, we got a GM, um, before we got them to air, 
you know, we taught them what we knew. We start playing. We build chemistry. And then they're like, we don't need you. Bye. And they go off and start their own show. We're like, okay, good luck. Everything we taught you. Good. Oh, crap. <laughs> Here he goes, you know, we even had uh, a DM that I was playing under um, and we still support and endorse the show Clinton's Core Classics doing our Rise of the Rune Lords that I was, I produced and edited for two seasons and I, or about a season and a half, and I played in the first one. Uh, and one of our guys, Ian Willems, who's in several of our shows, still plays with them. And they've gone off on their own and they have their own website now and, and kudos to them and, you know, that type of thing. And it's like, I just keep like, bleeding out extra talent and then all the shows have me as a gm and it's like i gotta get some fresh blood in here this is not the network is not supposed to be you know just everything that i gm with our same five players we're rotating players now for new shows and we have some we have some uh female gamers and the different age groups and ethnicities and you know the marginalized thing we're getting into all of that not to, to capture as a market just because um the chemistry changes you put mm -hmm. you put five old guys talking about the the day, back in the day, and it's great and it's a certain chemistry. And you put um, a different age group, or you you mix up the um, the ages of the players and everything, and you get a much more dynamic group, which I think reflects a that we met at a tavern, and within twenty four hours and a few beers, you're going to be camping in the wild with these maniacs. Um, that you know your character's fine, but they're all murder hobos, uh, and trusting your life and your back against terrible predators out there. Like you see how this is kind of what, you know. <laughs> um, and if you have a bunch of friends that all know each other, they make it seamless. But putting people together that don't know each other, this is one of the things we enjoy doing with our network. That sounds like the same thing. You you're reaching out and you're putting together shows from different shows, different, um, just different everything, and it's a different dynamic and a different chemistry than hey. Me and me and the boys have been playing for 20 years, and now here is our show. And everyone goes, wow, they're such great friends, such great chemistry. I'm telling you, there's a lot of good chemistry out there with people that just love the game, that love playing and meeting with other people. And you put them together in a room, and the magic happens. Um, now, I got to ask, so your, your, the professional aspect, this, mm -hmm. is, this is something that, that we've looked at and couldn't, couldn't think to find the time or make it work. Um, there is your own needs, your own rates, and then you ask individual people. But I'm assuming if you put an ad up saying, we will DM for you, mm -hmm. and people pony up, how do you get players in a room to play together that are spending money, but they don't like like half the other people, and then they'd complain to you going, hey man, I'm paying good money for you, but I don't like these people. Like, how do you deal with with that kind of thing, like the the one proverbial person that's like a different type of player. You know, there, there's role players, there's the combat bunnies, there's all these different people enjoy different styles of games. You're randomizing what comes in under a paycheck. How do you make a mesh? You just tell them to suck it up going, hey, they're paying too. Like how, would, how do you deal with this? Um, sorry, I'm trying to craft a question on the fly here, but I think it's a pretty original question for someone like yourself. How do you deal yeah. with that sort of like, you know, uh, so, you know, this whole thing's been kind of a, a trial by fire. So uh, we've been learning as we go. Um, but even initially, even when we first started doing this, we didn't have too many issues with that. Uh, it's, it feels like the people who want the pay to play and want consistency, or consistency and they want quality in their game tend to be pretty agreeable gamers already. Um, hmm. There's a few in there that maybe aren't, or there's a few conflicts. But one of the benefits of working with DGG versus say being just an independent professional DM is that we have what we call hot swaps. So if you're in a certain group and you're not meshing with that group or the DM style's not working for you, we'll swap you to one of our other games. You just keep your same rate, keep your same character and move over to their game and maybe you gel better with that group. And it could be the same module. We've got something like 16 DMs right now and they're each running several games. Um, so we have the ability to accommodate people who even have life changes. So, you know, maybe I don't know, uh, their job changes their shift and now they can't play on Tuesdays, but they really enjoyed playing with us and they want to keep playing. Hey, don't worry, man. We got that same exact module on Thursday uh, with this DM. They're great. We'll just move you over here and uh, you can meet some new friends. And it seems to work fine. Um, and one of the other things that we've done as we've been learning things too is, you know, before we just, uh, we posted the ad for the game. Hey, this is the game you're going to play. Um, you know, this is the rate and tell us what you, you know, apply with your character and we'll accept you, whatever. Um, 
to kind of now kind of set expectations, we've also included a meet your DM post that kind of describes the DM and their play style. So the person knows before they even go in, okay, this is like a DM who really enjoys the combat aspect of the game, or this is a DM who really likes role play, or this DM is very accommodating. Um, so they kind of know up front, all right, this is the kind of DM I'm working with, and they can see the applications of all the other players, which is why we do the application process. We're not very picky. Uh, it, I can't think of really any instance where we said, now nah, that player can't play. Uh, it's more so when people are looking at the game, they can see the other people in the party and be like, okay, this is the kind of group I want to play with. Oh, cool. Where can we find this application? Like, let's just try and drum you up some business here, because I really am interested in this aspect. And yeah, um, for our listeners, I think would also be interested in learning about this. And a little promo for you, if you don't mind me picking your brain on the subject a little bit further. Um, the application project, we, like if someone like myself, who always DMs and just wants to game and is willing to lay down, you take Canadian, yeah? Dollars? No. <laughs> if, if you pay PayPal, they do the converting. Oh, okay. So fine, fine. If you got PayPal, um, you're good. Okay, so, so let's say uh, I'm the I'm the proverbial customer, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, where would I go to find this application? Step one. Uh, there's so there's two ways to do it. Uh, well, really, there's one way to do it, but there's two. There was one way that's easy. If you know our Twitter, uh, you can go on our Twitter, and our very first pinned post has all our contact information. One of the links says "Play with DGG." You click it, and it immediately takes you to Roll Twenty and brings you a listing of every game we have open. Oh, cool. Um, so that's the easiest way. Um, if you don't want to go to our Twitter, you can just go to Roll Twenty. Um, and when you're searching for a game in the advanced uh, tab where you put in like keywords or whatever, if you put in Dark Galaxies Gaming, it'll bring up a listing of every game we have. Just pick a game and there'll be an application post in each game. Right on. Of course, very cool. That easy. So you've heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, Roll20. Head over and D Gaming with DDG, Dark Galaxies Gaming. All right. Um, now... I don't want to ask about your rates because I'm assuming that's something that's going to fluctuate. But like someone could listen to this a year and the rate could go up or come down or you might have a special on. So mm -hmm. we won't talk about like the actual rates you have. Um, but I do know because I have looked at this aspect is you're talking four hours of entertainment, usually for about the price of a two hour movie. And the movie never ends because every week there you are. And you know what I mean? And you guys make your money in bulk as opposed to you know, that kind of thing, right? So you have a group with four or five or six or whatever in it. Everyone's laying down their uh, movie ticket money, let's say, ish, around that ballpark, you know. Okay. Um, and you guys generate your interview. You pay your DM, I'm supposing, and everything, you know, eventually goes up the food chain. Um, but I got to say, I have spoken to a couple, like never aired. This is why I'm picking your brain publicly. I have spoken, reached out. This money, ladies and gentlemen, is, you know, it goes into the project, you know what I mean? Like, this is not a get rich quick. If you had a solo DM who wants a little part time job and plays one or two games and makes his X amount a week, then that's mm -hmm. it's not worth quitting your job for. And it's the luxury money for that DM. Good for him. What Corey's doing is with a network. And how many DMs have you got? We've got 16 DMs right now under our umbrella. Right. Times five or more, you know, 50 out of people or whatever. That money, money is going to go into you know, costs, so mm -hmm. many costs. Like we, I can't express enough. People just look at how we think big or look big or act big. And they're like, ah, you know, this, and it's like, no, 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 uh, we're in debt. <laughs> we're doing this for love. <laughs> you know, if no, you, uh, you know, no, we have Patreon. Dressing. If you want to help us check out Patreon, it's full of family and sympathizing cast members and a couple of fans, but you know, like they're just kind of, you know, they look at, um, uh, even the Glass Cannon podcast was talking, one of my favorites, about the $40,000 a month they make. And these guys had to pay fourteen grand to air condition a studio to get out of the living room. They have to pay rent for a studio in downtown New York. This is not cheap, people. Um, one of their guys is an, is an AV guy. And to give you better content, they bought $5,000 cameras, not $100, 920s that we're using. You know what I mean? Like the money goes into the business to grow the business first. Correct. And after four years, finally, one or two out of the five or six of them said, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to take a small piece of this to live on. You know, and again, then it becomes a time thing, devoting more time. That's what I'd like to do. <clears throat> I would just like this to pay for itself. I could quit my job and then be full time for the network to get to upgrade quality, to upgrade time, to upgrade deadlines, to upgrade up, you know, that type of thing. This is not a get rich quick stream, people. This is a, we're putting ourselves out there and our own money on the line just to do it for love. 
and we love doing it. I even told, like, my wife asked me, she's like, would you be doing this if we were on the lottery? I'm like, hell yeah. I'd get Elmore to paint my walls. <laughs> if I had a million dollars, you kidding me? The room would be epic, you know, and I would do this. <laughs> you know, we'd be doing it anyway. Um, so I just wanted to put that viewpoint out there as a content creator um, because a lot of, I've seen a lot of backlash going, why should, you know, why should I pay you five, 10, $20 when so-and-so when I can get a line game for free? Sure, you get a free game. But someone like Corey here is tailoring a game to you so many roll 20 games start and fail random people come together rage quit goodbye random people come together rage, and it's very daunting for the dm as just players bleed, bleed they have no investment but time yeah you, and you, that's exactly so if you want to know why this even started that's why it started when i when i got on roll 20 i you know i looked at the listing of games and i said pay to play i'm not gonna pay somebody to play a game there's all these free games I learned very quickly that free games don't last very long. Um, I would join a free game, it would fall apart, or the DM would be flaky, or you know, players wouldn't really commit. They kind of haphazardly show up, and I was like, man, this is nothing like the D and D experience, you know, or well, I guess the TTRPG experience I had when I was growing up. I was like, where you know, people showed up every week and everybody's invested into it. It's like, what's going on? And so I was like, all right, I'll try a paid game, and I, I tried one paid game, and that was bar none the better experience. Um, hmm. Everybody showed up because they were putting money into it. The DM always showed up. You know, he really cared about what he was doing. And I was like, this is awesome. And I was like, you know, I could do this too. I enjoy doing this already. And uh, and then when I did it and there was a lot of success, that's when I said, hey, maybe I can do this with like a network of people and, you know, make this even bigger and better. Uh, and as you said, it's not, for me at least, you know, for, for DGG itself, it isn't a high profit operation. <laughs> no. We, we definitely front end the page of the DMs. So of the people that come to the table and pay for their seat, that initial few seats, like initial four seats, is all towards paying our DM first. And then we don't really start making any money until those last few seats. Um, and then that money usually goes into, like you said, growing the company. So we're doing things um, like now we're starting to add Sirenscape to our games. So all our DMs are going to start using Sirenscape um, to add kind of that theatrical aspect to the game. Um, if you follow our Twitter at all, you'll see that we've just recently announced uh, that we're going to be doing an adventure module. We're actually going to be writing an actual adventure module. It's a really cool concept. We're super excited about it. Um, and then, of course, the streams, right? We're doing the streams as well. So that, mm -hmm. that money doesn't really end up being, you know, some people have this idea of, oh, you've got all these DMs and all these games. You guys must be making bank. Well, it's there's more to it. So I, I definitely, mm -hmm. I definitely tell you on that. Uh, you mentioned Sirenscape, uh, our go-to, and we were so lucky to interview Tim himself from tabletopaudio.com is now not mm -hmm. just having uh, ambient songs put up for free on his website at tabletopaudio.com. He has soundboards just like Sirenscape. And because I found them first, my loyalty goes to him and I use a lot of this material. And then, mm -hmm. then I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, I love all your work. And so would you please? And, and he sat there in a studio in, in New York and I ran his promo. Um, and uh, now Sirenscape is in bed with Paizo. As yep. far as I and know. And that, that's actually how we started using them. So um, one of our shows is a Paizo show, Paizo sponsored. Uh, we're doing Starfinder Dead Suns. Um, Sirenscape, or Sirenscape has a sound set for that entire adventure path. Hmm. Um, and it's like specifically catered to it. So it's not random sounds. It's actually the sounds of the characters and the vehicles and music and creatures or whatever that are in that game um, and designed to bring those scenes to life. So that's yes, when we started the... using it. And I kind of got familiar with it. And I was like, hey, we could kind of use this just in the business itself, not just on the show. This is really cool. So. Yeah, and, I, and we've used some of Tabletop, actually, um, because Roll20 kind of has it built in. Mm -hmm. uh, so for our D&D stream, we use a lot of Tabletop, too. They're both really great. Yes. Uh, now, Sirenscape is the more popular of the two, but like I said, for a low-budget GM that doesn't want to have to pay another subscription because he bought the books and everyone's like eating his chips and stuff, Tabletop Audio. There's a couple. There's Battle Bards also is uh, linked in there. SoundCloud was in Roll20 for a while and then dropped out because of whatever you know yeah. copyright was going on. Um, you have accidentally answered three questions in a row. So I get to skip down my list here about, um, you know, inspiration and, you know, where, where you're coming from. Like you're, you're, um, let's say somebody wants to, I'm assuming your paid games are not for view. They're private. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, okay. we, they're all public in the sense that they're open application. Mm -hmm. Um, although we, we do take private games. So if you have like a group that just wants a private game, we do that. Um, but none of them are streamed. Um, okay. 
in fact, for, if we do streams, if we ask a group to stream, that's usually not going to be a paid game. That'll be a, okay. you are streaming for us, so you're not paying anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And like I said, there's, there's, um, um, some of the, some of the names that you've tapped into and the charity events and everything. So, um, where can we find the show itself? Uh, so the shows all take place on our Twitch channel, which is a uh, twitch.tv slash dark galaxies gaming. Okay. Um, right now we have two, um, shows that are currently active. Um, that's going to be rise of the dragon queen on Thursdays and Starfinder Dead Suns on Tuesdays. Those are both in the evening. Um, our usual Friday game of uh, Saga is currently on a hiatus. Um, we may or may not be starting that back up again. There's some scheduling conflicts, but. Okay. Um, and then we do have more shows coming down the road. We have um, an Eberron based show. It's going to be called Relics of War. And uh, we also have a Ghost of Salt Marsh one that we haven't quite titled yet because it's a little earlier on in concept, but. I, I liked Eberron. I didn't get a ch much chance to play it, but the Warforged aspect, um, the fact that uh, DDO Online was sort of Eberron, and the political, almost Sherlocky intrigue. There were all these adventures where your players were in there, and they bring out this Sherlock Holmes wannabe, and he's the, like with the police, and you got to interact with the city guard like they do in a detective show, as opposed to your classic, you know, like run from the guard, hide from the guard, and then just like, yeah, what can you do? Your first level, I'm 20th, which just suddenly happens overnight. You know, we adventured around the wood, we came back, and now we're an army of five men that could just wipe out this town. You know, there's not a lot of interaction besides like, what do we need to go? Thank you, NPC, and off he goes. I found em uh, Eberron were a little bit more immersive with the common man NPC. You know, everyone, people that yeah. had a job, people that were like blacksmithing and stuff, they had dialogue and histories and stuff, and they were reinvested that you wanted to come back and give this guy's business, or you wanted to really like snow this cop and keep him off your trail, but not like kill him just to get rid of him. You know, that kind of thing. I enjoyed that aspect. Um, a new question for you. Do you attend <laughs> conventions and gatherings or, you know, where can fans go to meet you besides talking to you on Twitter? Is there an actual physical space that you are set up? Or, you know, we could catch you wandering down at your favorite show, that kind of thing, anywhere? Right now, there is not. Um, we haven't really grown to the size where it's been necessary, I guess would be the first thing. And then also, kind of what we were talking about before, uh, financially, we're not there yet, where we can fly out to conventions and be getting set up. Uh, we hope to, uh, especially, you know, once we get this 5e module completed and out there and we actually have, you know, a product people are familiar with, um, along with our streams and such, uh, maybe that would be something down the road that we would look at doing, but right now it's not a, not something we're doing. Okay. And where can we find you online? Now you're, uh, you're on Twitter at? At Dark Galaxies DM. Okay. Um, or you can find me personally. So my online persona is a root eye. Uh, I usually don't go by Corey in the actual streams, but um, uh, so you can find me at a root eye one three. If you want my personal account, company accounts, Dark Galaxies DM. Uh, you can obviously find us on Roll Twenty if you want to play a game. Um, and maybe if you go to our, if you go to our Twitter, there's a whole host of links to everything. It's got our YouTube on there. It's got um, our Patreon on there. It's got our listing to our games on there. So it's all there. Okay. Uh, one of the most fun things that we've ever done that we found out we could do for free is go to Teespring.com and start a merchandise store for free. And you can sell yourself a t-shirt and then have your cast walking around with them. Or you could, you know, put something out there and someone like Teespring goes, right, the cost is 12 bucks plus you want your 12 bucks plus shipping. And we made a bunch of t-shirts and we're like, this is so much fun. Look at all the pictures. Yay. And then we looked at the end cost to the customers, like 50 bucks or more. Who's going to pay that? We're nobody, like, you know, everything. So something we personally did was we took our profit margin down to like $5 so that the t-shirts are more like 20, 30 after shipping and teespring who makes the shirt for you you know takes its cut um and we have a fan spot some shirts and my guys have some you know it's a lot of fun uh just for like the hype and like for a little promotional you know you don't expect to make a lot of money uh and there is also charities that you can donate so we also uh, we donate some of our small proceeds to diabetes um do you have merchandise on the line and if not that's that's where i think you should because you can make mugs you can make banners you can make t-shirts you know do you have a merchandising line or anything i love the logo with the the sort of 1920s man in the moon black and white you know turned sideways with the skull <laughs> coming out the back of it that's brilliant i love that logo art that's you know you see that we're never gonna forget you man that is awesome 
<laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I love the logo, man. I, uh, I got to do it. He, uh, I described it to him and he nailed it. So um, as far as merchandise, not, well, not yet. Uh, we do have some ideas of things we'd like to do um, in terms of like hats and shirts and stuff, uh, but mm -hmm. not just DGG stuff, maybe kind of branded with uh, some of the stuff that is up and coming as well. Uh, the only like real merchandise I can think of off the bat, if anybody was interested in, is one of our reward tiers on our Patreon. You can get a D twenty that has our moon skull on it. Um, so oh, wow. how did you how did you stuff. wrangle that? Who made that for you? Uh, there's a few sites that do custom dye. I could get you the address to the one I I use, but uh, yeah, they'll uh, you as long as you got the artwork, you can make your own custom twenty sided die, and they print it right on the die and ship it off. Okay. Well, would you reveal? Because I'm sure besides listeners, like even a DM at home would be like, cool, I want to put my favorite art carny symbol on a dice and just use it at home. So would you mind sharing that information? Yeah, let me grab I mean, uh, we're, you know, and then you hit them up for sponsorship going, hey, man, I talked about your dice company publicly on this one <laughs> show. And, you know, so many opportunities, so many opportunities. Yeah, let me um, pull this up here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I thought you had it. Maybe you were politely withholding the information you had. To, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I just I don't have the top of my head, but I know it's... Uh, da, 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 da. Let me see. Okay. All right. Well, wh while you're uh, while you're mm -hmm. diving in there, may I ask you a few personal questions? The listeners would probably want to know. Uh, sure, you, go for it. Is this become, like, I know how engulfing, how many hours you have to put in. This is what I call my full-time, part-time job on top of the full-time, on top of life and wife and family and everything. Um, but what do you do for a living? Like, what do you, you know, as, as yeah. the commoner, as a regular man, you know, what uh, people are always interested in knowing uh, what you're currently doing. And it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer or a doctor. I've actually talked to people and or just currently, you know, in between jobs at the moment, the art history major out of college. But, you know, what what are you currently doing? Yeah, no, I'm not, uh, not not quite lawyer level. Uh, I do IT work, um, okay. uh, junior system administration currently. Oh, okay. That's my big job. Yep. And again, that that gets you a leg up on the technical aspects. Yeah, it, it definitely helps, especially learning the new softwares and stuff. It, uh, it's nice to have an understanding of how that stuff works. Okay. So while you continue to search, uh, can we talk about really quickly maybe your latest project or what, maybe what you have in works, you know, a little tease of what you got in the works for the future for us? Yeah, so probably the biggest thing, uh, well, we've got two things. We've got a show in the works that we haven't said a lot about. It's going to be based on a... Uh, module coming out called Odyssey of the Dragon Lords by Arcanum Worlds. Um, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. We're talking with some pretty, pretty big name streamers that might be hopping on board for it. So when we have more on that, we'll put it out there. Um, but probably the bigger thing right now and our primary focus is that uh, we are working on a 5e adventure module um, called Tales from Dildaria. Um, and it's a really fun setting agnostic concept that is not like anything else that's really out there right now. Um, the short version of the premise is that uh, the adventuring party is at a tavern. Um, this man, the sorcerer, barges into the tavern, uh, says some things about how he's finally going to get his revenge. He opens his magic book and sucks everybody in the tavern into it. Um, and basically, the subsequent story from there is you are traveling through this guy's adventure tales that he wrote when he was younger, trying to escape this book. And... Uh, it's a lot of fun. We're, we're really having some creative fun with it. Um, in particular, the guy, the sorcerer who wrote this book and imprisoned everybody isn't a very good writer. So a lot of his like literary blunders and stuff cause unusual encounters and like puzzles within the stories. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's, that uh, that sounds exciting. cool. That sounds cool. And uh, it remind, I can't remember, my daughter got us watching back in an anime uh we're the same they go into library and there's these four books and they they open the book and they, you know in they go and it's like oh it's right now they have a lot of anime out there about the guy from the regular world getting trapped into an alternate fantasy world there are several but this is a very old one where a couple girls opened a book and they got sucked in and one got to the good place one had a very rough time and she reappears almost as a villain halfway through the show and all i can remember is this this character running around calling for um the first person she's met just tomahome 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 just over and over and you're like oh god years later my daughter's older and we're like oh let's watch this again you know for some ideas we're watching it we're just cringing at how how bad <laughs> and i was like no um i'm not saying you took your inspiration from that um but a good idea is a good idea and yeah. 
if you don't as long as you're not stealing someone's direct material inspiration anime books choose your own adventure other campaigns and you look at something going well that's really neat world setting but i would do this with it and flip it over you know inspiration come from anywhere um I think I already know the answer to my next question is like, where does your main source of inspiration comes from? It's probably Star Wars expand. You know, like. uh, well, for this for this project or in general, in general, uh, in, general mean, in general, in general, in general, yeah, Star Wars, at least the storytelling uh, aspect of it, uh, probably that in Bioware games. I play a lot of Dragon Age and a lot of Mass Effect and things like that. Those two like storytelling universes are the sort of things that inspired me the most. Oh, yeah. I really enjoy the whole like. Um, not space opera per se, but like story opera with like a grand oh, story arc of interesting yeah, characters, yeah, yeah, yeah. like choices oh. that matter. That That's really what drives me. My wife played all the way through Dragon Age. I hadn't got into it. My wife and I both played Mass Effect. And while she like picked the first guy and stayed loyal to him for three games, I, I couldn't help myself. I did the Captain Kirk. I was like, well, you're nice to me. Oh, can I have both? No. Okay, fine. Well, you're nice to me. And the second one is like, oh, my, how, how, how you've grown. And you get the third one is like, oh, wow, your hair grew long and you look and you're really nice. Okay, well, Jake, well, you know, dating all these different people. Um, <laughs> and then I came across a Pathfinder adventure path called Jade Regent. And the DM runs a caravan where you have to travel quite a long ways. And there are these static NPCs that are this rotating Mass Effect cast. And they have dating scores. They have a number. And I'll, I'll, as you role play and stuff and find trickets and try to woo them, you get points towards this DC. And when you hit it, then they become possibly romantically interested in you. And there's the caravan driver, uh, this little old lady of um, of Desna, who scores really low, which I think is funny. It's like, I don't have a lot of years left, honey. Let's go. <laughs> like, <laughs> make Grammy yeah, happy. Awesome. you know. Uh, and then there, of course, is the main NPC who just happens to be incredibly important Disney story-wise by the nudge, nudge, wink uh, princess aspect by the end. And her, story, her score is phenomenally high. You yeah, know, you're looking at the score like, nah, uh, it's fine. Uh, the little old lady will do, you know, but we're fine. Uh, but I saw this and I was like, that's Mass Effect, man. That's, you know, what a great idea to put this in. This. And why has anybody else done this? So I'm telling everybody about Jade Regent because it's like a DM could look at the system and go, um, instead of deciding to do your favorite player or that was a good hit line or whatever, you know, how, how can the DM judge? It's supposed to be neutral. It's like here, you know, this, this person is a bit of a stickler. You know, you, you got to work on them. You know, guy, girl, you know, animal companion, we don't judge, whatever, you know, whatever your interest lies or whatever to bring that aspect. Um, and I think if it's in the ruling number system, then it's not quite as cringy or as weird for just players making some players feel uncomfortable at the table by flirting with each other or flirting with the DM. Mm -hmm. If no, I'm saying like in a in a space like yourself where it's like a pay to play or roll 20, you don't know the people. Obviously, your friend game with your buddies. Um, you've established these boundaries a long time ago. Uh, we're about to get into an evil campaign, all villainy, and we're going to, we're mm -hmm. really, our, our launch of, in October of uh, Pathfinder's Hell's Vengeance called the Foul Play Podcast. And we're prepping for it. And you look through this book and it's like, how evil do you want to be? How dark are you going to go? Are you going to fade to black? Are you, you know what I mean? Like how gore, and you, there's all these things you wouldn't even think of when the players are the bad guys and they're not fighting against a good guy realm. The whole country is not, very nice and they're trying to stop a paladin uprising in sorry but i i digress we've been talking a little bit too much about myself but we've been talking to Corey thomas from the dark galaxies network and if you want to dare to compare our we shot first star wars saga podcast and his awesome live streaming that you know there's the guy and they're playing different feels same content you can you never get enough of star wars we're the guys to see but i got i he's probably you know, much better than, <laughs> than what we got going on <laughs> you guys you know the guy's got the, the guy he's got the acting chops or whatever um cory thank you so much for being on the show and telling us uh, the business aspect the personal aspect and of course the promotional aspect of darks galaxies gaming it's been a great pleasure and honor talking with you thank you so much for being on the show today yeah thank you for having me it was a good time and we'll see you next time on attack of opportunity <laughs> <laughs>